worship the Lord. Um, we have a few announcements in here this morning. Um, um, well, for one, if you have not walked through our Family Life Center, um, you have the kids have a treat for tonight. So it looks amazing over there. Uh, the ladies have worked very hard. Uh, yesterday we were here for a very long time working. Um, Amy and Sonia and Vicki and um, myself and Sam, uh, we, they, there was a lot of work going on here yesterday. So don't let the animals attack you when you go that way though. Um, so uh, the announcements, um, Circle of Hope is uh, having the yard sale um, August 10th. So if you have any donations, uh, they'll gladly be accepted. Um, just put them upstairs in the class of Christian Fellowship. Um, the Circle of Hope is collecting um, uh, canned vegetables for their food drive. Um, let's see. Um, and VV, VBS kicks off tonight. Um, we are so excited for that. Um, and the meal will start at 530. Um, and I think our men of Bethesda are doing hot dogs. Um, and the meeting uh, for the bylaws, if anybody's interested in that, will be uh, July 21st at 6 p.m. And I think Vicki needs to talk about VBS. But, yeah. Good morning. We're excited about VBS, our kickoff for VBS. Sarah's right, there's been a lot of work going in downstairs. If you can't be here, please walk downstairs to the Family Life Center and see all the work. It took many, many weeks and many, many days and lots of hours, but we are so excited about it. It's a jungle theme, but yet it talks about the creation of the world. And so many times we forget about how God created all these wonderful things we have today. There is an insert in your bulletin. Everybody look at it. If I have something wrong, let me know. But I have the men tonight, the Methodist men. Monday night, Circle of Hope. Tuesday night is our Methodist women will be doing theirs. Wednesday night is the co-ed class. If something's wrong and it's not correct, please tell me. There will be food every night. Come, enjoy, watch the kids have fun. Be a kid with them. That's what we want you to do. That's what Bethesda is. We are a family. We do things together. So if you see kids doing something, join them. I'm glad to have you. But please, VBS kicks off at 5.30 tonight. Enjoy, come, have fun, watch the kids. Join the party that they're gonna have because I promise you, it's gonna be a spiritual party that they're gonna have fun. Thank you. Your turn, Judy. I don't even know what you're doing. Everybody stand up and sing. Father, 
Bethesda. Let's see you smile. You look beautiful when you smile. You know, you do laugh, live longer when you smile and you laugh. So this is the day the Lord has made. And he says, rejoice and be glad in it. Vicki, now it's my turn. Oh, she, <laughs> she threw me off. It doesn't take much to throw me off. <laughs> Anyways, um, God, I'm shaking. Why am I shaking? Lord, come down and calm me down. <laughs> oh, Lord. But uh, anyways, there's a lot to pray for, a lot to praise. What? Who did? Oh, Ricky did. Oh, well, Ricky, let's sing happy birthday to him. That's a praise. At least he's here another day, another year. Happy birthday to you. 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Ricky. Happy birthday to you and many more. I do that best. Oh, dear. Anyways, uh, God, I'm still shaking. I got the shakes. Huh? He did. Golly. Oh, first we're going to go in our uh, prayer. Golly, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Satan, I bound you in the name of Jesus. Make me stop shaking. Vicki got me started. I'm going to blame her. You know, we all wanna, always want to blame someone, right? But anyways, today, prayer request is our country. We really need to pray for our country. Jean Black, uh, is it Sh Shally Wellburn? Pardon me? Oh, Stanley. Oh, Stanley Wellburn. I'm sorry, I can't even read. Uh, Carrie Beasley and all the children. Unspoken. Lynn Walker, Paulette Kirk. Pat Donnelly, Wyatt Stewart. I want to pray for my Christy. She's getting ready to go to uh, the Virgin Islands, and she's been having panic attacks. And she called me right before I came to church. She said, Grandma, please lift me up in prayer. And uh, anyways, we want to go ahead and pray for these people. I also want you to pray for the shut-ins that we have every week. Every week. There's a lot of sick people out there. A lot of people that need our prayers. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, before I do that, I just well, I, I brought this about angels. Angel wings. As I sat alone, I feel the kiss, and he touched like an angel's wing. Is it in my mind, or do I hear an angel's chorus sing? I know I felt the softest brush of angels coming by. It must be true, for on my knee, a feather I did see. Now when I'm tired or sad at heart, the angels come to sing. I know they're there for the feathers I find are those of an angel's wing. I believe in angels, and I believe God has given each one of us a guardian angel that guards us all the time and protects us. And I just wanted to read you about angels. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just want to praise you. We don't praise your name enough. You love our praises. You are a good and gracious God. You're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Father, your word gives us hope. We have hope, we have strength, and we have love from you. And Father, right now, I just want to lift up what happened yesterday, Donald Trump, and I praise you. I praise you that he was not killed. And Father, there's no place in the United States of America, I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat, but we should not have to worry about being killed or shot at. These are sick people, Father. And we bind them in the name of Jesus that Satan is not going to get to our leaders. And Father, we have a sick country right now, and we do need a lot of prayer. And I don't know if it's we don't praise you enough, we don't lift you up enough, but Father, you are our strength, you are our refuge, and our, our helmet of salvation. And Father, I just praise you and thank you again. All these prayer lists that we lifted up to you, Father, touch each one. You know what's in each of their hearts and what their needs are. And Father, there are so many people out here in our congregation, out in our community, and in our county, everywhere that are so sick. Some are sicker than others. And Father, they need your healing hand 
for the pain that they're going through. A lot of us have problems. Each one has certain things in their families, and we lift them up to you. We ask you to touch them in the mighty need of Jesus. And Father, you tell us in your holy word, you have not because you ask not. And Father, we're asking you right now to touch all these prayer requests, touch everyone here in the congregation and church today. They each have their own special needs. And Father, I ask you to touch the prayer requests that we have every week in our bulletin. Father, there's many, many that are really sick. And Father, you are the uh, great physician and the great healer. And so we're lifting everybody up to you. And Father, I uh, want to especially lift up America. Lift up America. We are a sick country, and we should not be like we are now. And I look in the paper, you see killings in Winston, Greensboro, High Point, every day there's somebody that's getting killed, senseless killing. And Father, we ask you to heal our land. We're begging you, heal our land, hear our prayers. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. I'm shaking. I'm still shaking. Yeah, help me down. <laughs> I, I need all the help I can get. I, I'm not a woman's lib. <laughs> Don't mind asking for help. so much shakes as Judy. I may in a minute though. It will worry me. Uh, it's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. When I was a kid, um, growing up here at Bethesda, I was obsessed with music, just like I am now, obviously, if you couldn't tell. But well, one Sunday years ago, probably 11, 12 years ago, I was sitting in the congregation just like you all. I was with my parents, and uh, I was sitting and watching our praise band sing and that's back when we had probably 15 people in the band if you remember on the other in the gymnasium family life center whatever we call it um and i remember just looking up and i was obsessed with it and i was like that's what i want to do i want to be involved with music and i want to do it for the lord and that's just me at 11 years old and um so i contemplated back and forth a couple sundays you know believe it or not some of you see me being raised up. I was a little wild child, but I still was shy talking to other people. So I contemplated going up to John and be like, you know, uh, John Essex, who was a previous worship player, great, great person in my life. Uh, I love that man very much. Um, I, I contemplated going up to him one Sunday after church and asking, you know, if I could be involved and uh, sing with him. Although I didn't know I could really sing at that age, but I was going to try. And uh, maybe three Sundays after that, I, uh, I, I'll never forget, it was back at the sound desk, going out the door. And I called him. He was talking to somebody else, if you could imagine that. And uh, I just waited there until he was done. And uh, little Devin looked up and said, hey, John, uh, would you be willing to let me, you know, sing in the praise band one Sunday? And if you know John Essex, he was like, absolutely. Uh, he, was, he gladly let me. And uh, he said, we have practice on Tuesday nights. If you want to get somebody to bring you? And uh, Casey Williams, uh, if you remember Casey, she gave me a ride that following week. Um, I remember it vividly. We ate kimonos, and then we went to praise band practice. Um, it was the impact of my life. Uh, and from then, I was in the band. I was singing a couple Sundays, and just still 
obsessed uh, watching John lead worship, lead, lead you guys. And I was like, you know, I feel like that's my calling. At that age, I was like, that's my calling. That's what I want to do, at least in this season. That's what I want to do. I want to lead worship like John. And it was a dream. And I was saying, you know, I, I would love to be a worship leader one day. But over time, um, I sort of let go of that dream because I, was, I became the drummer just two years later because Justin Vogel, you remember Justin, he went off to college, and the uh, spot was open, and I knew it was going to be open, so I was taking drum lessons for a while before that because I wanted that job. Um, and uh, so I kind of let go of the worship leading dream. So hear me out. So about 11 years later, roughly, not very good at math, 2021, 2022, um, I'm mowing, doing my thing during the summer, and I get a phone call, you know, worship leading positions open Bethesda, are you interested? The dream was alive again. That same feeling I felt as a little boy entered my soul again. And I was super excited. And uh, because I looked up to John my whole life, I was like, that's, that's what I want to do. I want to do what John did. And uh, so I met with the hiring team. You know, obviously, here I am, got hired. Um, but a childhood dream had finally come um, true at last. But here's my point. I had a childhood dream that I didn't think would ever come true. So I quit dreaming. I quit dreaming, but one day it came true and caught me unaware. I didn't see it coming. So if you would at this time type to or turn to Habakkuk chapter 2. Um, probably a, probably you know, a book in your Bible that you're not very familiar with. But this morning we're not going to look at delayed dreams. That was just an example. We're going to be looking and focusing on delayed visions and try to discover why it, be, why it might be taking so long for God or for a vision to display itself. So if you would uh, follow along with me in Habakkuk chapter 2, uh, we're going to read verses uh, 1 through 3 to begin with. Verse 1 says, I will take my stand at my watch post. This is Habakkuk speaking. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. Uh, for still, the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. So here we see a Habakkuk, who's a prophet, preacher, whatever you want to call it, saw himself as a watchman. It says, I will take my stand at the watch post. He was, he was standing and watching on the walls of Jerusalem, waiting for a message or a vision from God that he could share with the people. See, sometimes in life, what we need in our waiting is vision. In verse 1, we see that God will sometimes reveal his plan slowly to us. Habakkuk said, I will stand my watch, which means that he would continue watching and continue waiting until he heard from the Lord. Sometimes we have to wait, and it's hard to stay in time we live in an instant gratification world. If I want that car, I can just get a loan tomorrow and get the car in a few days. If I want to snoop on my friends and see what they're doing, I can pull out my phone right here, pull out my phone, get on Facebook, and figure out what they're doing. But the facts are sometimes those things fail us, and we have to wait to find out some things. Perhaps it's so we continue to rely on God and be eager in seeking his face and being faithful in our devotion. Because there's one thing that's true. It is impossible, it is impossible to walk with God in a hurry. It is impossible to walk with God in a hurry. And I found this passage so, so useful in the season that Bethesda is in. I named this sermon, Faith in the Waiting, because we are somewhat in a waiting period. We are waiting for a pastor. We are waiting for a worship leader. We are waiting for children. We are waiting for new members, etc. The list goes on. We can easily get in a hurry and get impatient to try to take things into our own hands. It's tough, and I get it. Sometimes it feels like God is almost punishing us, and punishing us, it almost feels like suffering. But the truth is, waiting can feel like suffering at times, too. When we suffer, we often think, how can we get out of this as quick as possible? How, how, can, we, how can we get a pastor as quick as possible? How can we get uh, a worship leader as soon as possible? But if you're in church, if, if you're sitting there today thinking that, um, ask yourself, how, how can we get out of this? 
How about asking yourself this? Look at it differently. Instead of saying, how can we get out of this? How much can I get out of this? How much can I get out of this time and this season we are experiencing as a church? A friend of mine always says this to me whenever I come complaining to him. He's also my boss, so I come complaining a lot to him. Um, whenever I'm complaining to him um, or I'm, I'm just wanting something, eager about something, or something's just on my heart, he says, well, Devin, have you prayed about it? Have you prayed about it? Stumps me every time. See, in prayer, we transfer the release to God. We transfer our trust to God that he will handle that situation. We should keep watch at all times. Keep watch at all times in order to hear what the Lord will say. And we should also keep an eye out for an explanation. An explanation of what he has spoken once we do hear from him. If a vision is indeed from God, then it will one day become a reality, but only at his appointed time. In verse 2, he says that our vision must be written down on tablets. Some of y'all may not be familiar with what tablets are, and uh, these were displayed in public. Uh, the King James Version uh, says this, write the vision and make it plain upon tablets. And I'm going to show you a picture of one. That's what it somewhat looked like. Now, the word tables, um, in our version, um, is not ref referring to a piece of furniture, um, obviously. Um, another definition of a table is a written list, a written list as in a form that displays facts and figures. For example, we have timetables in math class for multiplication. The word tablets refers to boxwood tables. This is what this is, a boxwood table covered with wax on which national affairs were engraved with an iron pen and then hung up in public at the prophet's own house or at the temple that those who passed might read them. And I didn't know that, so I found that. Um, God says, write it down on a wooden tablet and make our vision so plain that it may be seen by everyone. It should be as a highway sign that is so clear that even a passing runner can see it and understand it immediately. The modern example I can give you for that is is it, it needs to be as visible as a billboard that when you're going down the highway, a speeding driver, can, can, they can't miss it. They can see it. We are to take note. We are to mark it. We are to remember it for future reference. It's like, it's like a college student um, who's aspiring to be a surgeon. Let's just say it's a her. Um, she may hang up pictures, you know, in her bathroom or in her office um, of different hospitals she wants to work um, in her future to keep her motivated. You know, it's a, it's a declaration to her, herself, her friends, her family that allows uh, them to encourage her and hold her accountable. But verse 3 says, For still the vision awaits its appointed time, and not yet. If we feel called or compelled to do something for the Lord, and we have a desire to see that vision become a reality, it will eventually happen. But if the vision is not fulfilled immediately, we need to keep in mind that it's only delayed, not denied or not deleted. The Lord says, wait for it, and it will surely come. It will not delay. At the end, it will speak. When it's time, all will be revealed. God's delays are not God's denials. If the Lord were to show us everything right now, we would not believe it. And that's just the fact. We would not be able to handle it. We would not believe it. We'd probably fall out and die. We're going to drop down now and, and finish out our scripture today or for, from Habakkuk. Habakkuk 2, verses 4 and 5 says, Behold, his soul is puffed up, pride. It is not upright with him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Verse 5, Moreover, wine is a traitor and an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as shoal. Like death, he has never enough. He gathers himself, all nations, and collects as his own, all people. The end of verse 4 says, But the righteous shall live by faith. And you need to ask yourself, what is faith in the waiting? What does that look like? Faith in the waiting is backed by the truth that summarizes Habakkuk 2, which is God is working in your waiting. You see, the Lord wants us to wait on Him and His timing, but unfortunately there are people who are arrogant, trying to live without the Lord's help. They feel that if God won't reveal His plan immediately, or if he's, if he's delayed in fulfilling his vision, that they can come up with their own plan. They believe they can figure it out 
on themselves, but they can't. Those, those people tend to also be, well, that's all there is to it. Their heart is not right with the Lord, and if we're not careful, this same maverick attitude can manifest itself in any one of us here today. Many times we think, and there's not a person here who's never thought that, that we think that we are a, uh, a know-it-all. You know, We all have that moment that we think we're a know-it-all. We know something more than somebody else. Sometimes it, it could be anything. It don't matter what example it is. It's, uh, you know, maybe an older person looked down on a, a younger uh, person saying, you know, well, I've been around doing this longer. I have more experience. You know, he or she don't know what she's doing. They have a lot to learn. You know, I know it all. We believe we've got it all figured out. We go out and we try to do it ourselves, and there isn't anyone who's going to stop us. No one's going to stop us when we get our minds set on something. But when we do this, we start messing with God's will. And he's going to try to start speaking to us and try to remind us to trust him. The thing is, though, we get so caught up in our own vision and trying to force it to happen, we can become obsessed with our own plans. That we forget who's at the heart of the vision. So many people today want to take charge. They want to make important decisions. They want to run things. And maybe it's for their own pride. We don't know. Many traditional churches today put themselves before God. And hear me what I'm about to say. I may make you mad, but at the end of my sermon, I'm wanting to lift you up. Hear, hear me close to what I'm about to say. This is not your church. Don't throw me off the stage yet. This is not your church. This is the church you attend as a body of believers, as a one congregation here each Sunday. Yes, that is true. But this is not your church. This is God's church. This is his temple. It doesn't matter if it's your first Sunday here, your second Sunday here, your tenth year here, if you've been, all here, if you've been here all your life. The church is built on God and God alone. We can easily forget who's really in charge and refuse to slow down. And listen to what God has to say. We start listening to our own feelings instead of the Lord. But we shouldn't do that. We can make decisions on our own terms, but things only happen through the power and the glory of our Lord and Savior. Kyle Mercer once said, Live by faith and not by feelings. Live by faith and not by feelings. No one knows our feelings better than the Lord. And no one knows our future better than He does. God knows more about us than we know about ourselves. And that's the truth. And have, having faith is realizing this. Is realizing this. You, you, can't change, you can't change the past. You can't control the future. So trust God in the presence. Psalm 139, 1 through 6 says this. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and, and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. If the Lord knows more about us than we do ourselves, it's foolish to rely on our own knowledge. We need to ask God for guidance. And he, want, he wants us to ask Him for that. Does anybody know what an acronym is? Now, I'm not the brightest, but I actually know what an acronym is. It's a word formed from the first letter of a series of words. So let's take, I had an example here, the word laser. Uh, it stands for light amplification by stimulated emission. Well, believe it or not, and some of y'all may already know this, but there's an acronym in the Bible. It's in Matthew 7, 7. Jesus said, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find it. Knock and it will be opened to you. What's the Lord telling us to do in Matthew 7? There are three key words. Ask, seek, and knock. Oh, sorry, that's the scripture. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. There we go. I may have flipped them. I'll fix them in a minute. Sorry. There are three key words, ask, seek, and knock. The first letters of these three words form the acronym ASK. Now I go to Matthew 7, 11. There we go. Immediately after telling us to ask, Jesus went on to say in Matthew 7, 11, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things 
to those who ask him. So, so just how does the Lord get our attention? Allow me to share an illustration of a, of a mother and her child. And I guess I, I, I mean, I've read this illustration, but I guess it's, it, I've done the same thing. So I guess you can say it's me and my mom. Uh, a mother takes, uh, well, they just go shopping, you know, throughout their whole lives of his childhood, whatever. Um, and as they're shopping, the boy gets very confident. He's a very confident, prideful young man. He thinks he has his mama around his little finger. So as they're shopping, he gets overly confident, saying, well, I can, I can go on in the store. I'll be able to find my mom when I want to come back. You know, he was overly confident. Uh, well, the boy, the boy departed from his mother another time. You know, it scared, it would scare his mom. When he would walk away, she was scared he could, she couldn't find him. But he was confident he would always find her. Well, the boy did it one more time, and the mother thought she would get sneaky. <clears throat> and when she wasn't, when he wasn't looking, she hid behind a clothes rack. And uh, when the child realized that his mother was missing, he he, he got scared and went looking for her. Um, his mother then decided um, that she had enough, or he had enough, and she came out of her hiding space and behind the clothes rack. When the boy saw her, he dashed to her and clung to her. And from that time forward, he then stayed by his mother's side and never left her out of sight again. And as in this illustration, we too can, can become prideful and overconfident, thinking we can do it all on our own, which is a sin. And similar to this illustration, God will hide from us. Isaiah 59, 2 um, says, Your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. So that he will not hear. The Lord will seem to stop speaking to us, or stop revealing things to us, in order to gain our attention again, and cause us to turn back to him. But we need to point out that it's not always God hiding from us, or has turned his face away from us, it is us who have turned our face away from God. The Lord can't reach us through pride, so he may choose to humble us through disappointment or a wounded heart, through a vent in your life. In doing so, the Lord is forcing us into the wilderness of our own self to come face to face with our own inability and weakness. Mark 1, um, verses 12 and 3 says this, Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beast. And the angels ministered to him. Jesus had done no wrong, but he was still driven into the wilderness where the devil tempted him. And the reason for that was to ultimately see um, who he would ultimately rely on in um, time of need. So what is it about the wilderness that seems to beckon us? What is it that draws us into the wilderness? Matthew 3, Matthew chapter 3, 3 says this, John the Baptist uh, was the one, voice of the one crying in the wilderness. In Luke 5, 16, Jesus often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. In Matthew 14, we see that sometimes he even prayed on top of a mountain. Psalm 55, 6, Psalm 55, 6 and 7 envisions the wilderness as a place of rest. It says, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. Indeed, I would wander far off and remain in the wilderness. Now, there are sp some spiritual benefits to the wilderness. There are. And there is an emotion that surrounds the idea of journeying into the wilderness. But the wilderness is not always a, a nice getaway uh, that you would imagine. Two scripture references tell us exactly what God uses the wilderness for. Matthew 4, 1 says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Luke chapter 3, verse 2 says, The word of God came to John the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. So what does the Lord use wilderness for? One, he uses it to test us. And number two, he uses it to reveal things to us. But, it, but it's difficult in the wilderness. It's difficult to be in the wilderness. It's hard. It's, e it's real easy to worship when things are going well. It's real easy to worship when things are going well, but it's hard to worship when in the wilderness. The wilderness is a purging ground, a place of spiritual cleansing. 
the Lord will allow us to experience a wilderness of our own making, one born out of independent choices where we are tested in our character. When we are lost in the wilderness and seeking a way home, exhausted from trying to fix everything by ourselves, if we just call out to the Lord, that he will speak us in the wilderness, speak to us in the wilderness. Often it's when we are alone that he will speak to us, speak to us and reveal to us what he needs, what we need to do in order to get back on track. It's when he reveals more pieces of the puzzle. We see this in how and when Jesus spoke with his disciples. Mark 4, 34, we read, But without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. Jesus shared all things when they were alone, and sometimes that's how the, wor the Lord works in our life. But all this heartache and all this hassle and all this stress could be avoided if we just did one simple thing. And that's walk by faith. Because one day you'll see there's going to be a difference in what you see in God's Word and what you see in your world. Going back to back at chapter 2, verse 4, we read that the righteousness, or excuse me, the righteous shall live by his faith. The New Testament teaches us that the righteous shall also receive the reward and see the vision fulfilled by his faith. I know I've thrown a lot of scripts at you, but I believe this is one of the last. Um, Hebrews 10, 35 through 38 says, Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now that the just shall live by faith, the righteousness shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And the writers of Hebrews was referencing to Habakkuk um, in that passage. Here's the point. It would take faith for the people of Judah to live in God's way and to abide by his timing. It would take faith to continue hoping in the vision of returning to their homeland and wait for the appointed time. Habakkuk knew the difficult times were coming to the people of Judah. If you, go, if you want to read Habakkuk 1 on your own. Um, their resource was to trust God's word and rest in his will. Faith is act of trust in God's character. To live by faith means to believe God's word and obey it no matter how we feel, what we see, or what the consequences may be. So what do, what do we learn from this passage? We see that if we have a vision to serve the Lord, that we shouldn't allow ourselves to become impatient and try to take things into our own hands. If we do, the Lord will, seeming, will seem to uh, let us go our own way, hide from us, hide his face from us in order to draw us back in, hopefully so that we will see he's the one in, in ultimate control. And if we acknowledge that he's in charge and be patient and trust him, and he will once again speak to us, guide us. You see, God is silent. God may seem silent in your life right now because you or we are not being silent. Maybe we're trying to run everything, be on as many committees as possible so we can, we can be the one to make decisions. Make the decisions. Make the decisions as quick as, quick as possible, etc. But the Word shows that when you get silent, it gets very loud on the inside. Constantly keeping the vision at the forefront of our mind, and we're walking by faith each step of the way. So I have a challenge. I always like to have a challenge in each of my sermons if I can. My challenge is this, and I don't know what setting it could be in. Um, I know we have a vision committee. Um, and that's great. I know we have all these committees, and that's wonderful. My vision is this. This is pointed at the vision team, but I think it would be great for all the committees. And uh, Anyways, so I say you go in your next meeting. Say your meeting takes an hour. I don't know. Go in. Everybody come together. Just, just bring one piece of paper. Write all your visions down. Write all your visions down for the first ten minutes of the meeting. Once you're done with that, place the paper right in the middle of the table. Everybody's sitting around the table. Take the next 50 minutes to an hour, and we're praying over those visions for this church. Praying over, just praying without ceasing. Praying without ceasing, saying, God, I don't, I don't know what you want us to do. I don't know what you, where you want us to go. 
I don't know if any of these visions will even work here at Bethesda. But if it's your will, show us. Show us. That's my challenge. You and, it may, and like I say, it may not be in that setting. It, 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 it may be everybody goes home today and we bring a piece of paper back in a few weeks and we have like a prayer day, a prayer night. We pray over that. I don't know what that looks like. But that's my challenge for you. Um, do, with it, do with it what you want. The righteous shall live by his faith. The same thing is true about salvation. We live eternally by faith. You see, we often try to take matters into our own hands when it comes to eternal life. We try to save, our, we try to save ourselves through good works. And maybe you need to hear this. I had to hear it just a few years ago as a prideful little punk teenager kid. Uh, the just or righteous person doesn't get you to heaven. Good works does not get you to heaven. You know, the just or righteous person isn't someone who's met all of God's requirements by means of good works. Romans 3.20 says, By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. We cannot justify ourselves before God. All we can do is put saving faith in Jesus Christ, His work on the cross, because that is the only way to be saved. Um, so in closing, my question to each of you gathered here today is this. Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Put faith in that Jesus died a bloody death on the cross for you and for me. And He rose three days that we can live eternally together as one in heaven with Him. Do you have faith in God's vision for your life? Do you have God's, or you have faith in God's vision for your church, for this church? We may not always like God's vision for us. The pastor we receive, you may not like his type of preaching. It may not be your style. The worship leader you receive may not play the type of music, the type of style of music you like. as long as it glorifies God and displays the truth and put yourself aside and put your faith and trust in Him and watch His plan unfold making all things work for good and it will bless this sanctuary here at Bethesda. That's my prayer yesterday that's my prayer today, that's my prayer tomorrow and that's my prayer forevermore here at Bethesda Church and it should be yours too. Romans 8, 28 says this. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. Who would pray with me? Lord, we just, we just thank You today. Thank You for getting us here this morning. We just thank You that that you will answer our prayers in your perfect timing. Reveal what is in our hearts and make us ready to handle the answer in the right way when it comes. God, help us to pray by faith consistently a long term to believe, to wait, and to move forward in your timing. Help us to be, be patient in prayer, to not give up, and trust you even during moments when we, we may feel like negative emotions. Help us not to live by feelings, but live by faith. Help us not to take matters into our own hands. We choose to trust you. We, we, we refuse to believe the lies of the enemy. We rebuke the devil right now in this place in your holy name, Jesus. Help us choose to be faithful in prayer, deepen our understanding, and give us a great knowledge of what you're going to do in each of our lives and in this church, in this sanctuary. Stretch our faith in the midst of waiting, just as you did with your disciples when encountering a storm of the sea. We thank you that you have all wisdom and will answer our prayers in the perfect way. We pray this in your precious and holy name. Ushers, please come forward.
darkest places I will call Incline your ear to me anew And hear my cry for mercy Count my sinful ways. How could I come before your throne? Yet full forgiveness meets my gaze. I stand today by grace alone. I will wait for you, surely wait for you. On your word, I will rely, and I will wait for you, surely wait for you, till my soul is satisfied. So put your hope. in his power to save completely and forever one by Christ emerging from the grave I will wait for you I will wait for you on your word I will rely I will wait for you wait for you till my soul is satisfied. I will wait for you. I will wait for you on your word. I will rely. I will wait for you. Surely wait for you till my soul is satisfied. Himself has paid the price that all who trust in Him today find healing in His sacrifice. That all who trust in Him today find healing in His sacrifice. I will wait for you, I will wait for you on your word. I will rely, I will wait for you, surely wait for you till my soul is satisfied. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. Lord, we ask that you be with us in our walk of faith with you, Lord. We ask you to bless this offering for your kingdom, Lord, and have it in your will, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You would stand. If you would, uh, today is Prayer Shawl Sunday. Uh, you'll see at the kneeling benches uh, bone pillows. These bone pillows will be going to Davidson uh, Hospice of Davidson County. Uh, if you would, during this last song, uh, you feel led uh, by the Lord, come and pray over these that uh, each person that's going to be receiving these will be a comfort with the hands that has made them and with the prayers that has been prayed over them. Out of the wilderness into your deliverance look 
like where I'm standing now These hands that once were chained Now lifted high in praise Don't look where I'm standing now Look where I'm standing now I stand on the chain break Miracle make powerful name of Jesus on the body raised, prodigal saved, powerful name of Jesus. Live by your mighty hand into the promised land oh look where I'm standing now you carry the cross for me now I am a child of me oh look where I'm standing now look where I'm standing now I stand on the chain My Savior rescued me. Hallelujah. I'm Think of the faith you have every day. 
You live by faith every day with something. If you have faith in your alarm clock that it goes off in the morning, you get up, some of us. You live by faith in your car that it cranks in the morning. You make it to work on time, church on time, your, your breakfast club, you retired people. You, you, you have trust and faith in your car. If you ever been to the mountains, maybe Tennessee, Virginia, I'm not sure there's a couple that I've been through, them one-lane them one lane tunnels where you got a mirror and you got to honk your horn before you go through. You have faith that the other car coming through doesn't forget to honk their horn and you get, bang! You have faith. When you sat in this pew this morning, you didn't come in here looking for uh, rusty nails, rusty screws, or if there's screws missing. By faith, you sat down in that pew. Everything we do is by faith. Take that same faith and put it in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you will know who Jesus is. You accept him by faith, and he comes into your life, and you know who he claims to be. Live by faith as you walk out this door today. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Have a blessed Sunday.